Hey, Emily, what's on your radar? Well, on Monday, the New York Times ran a poignant essay under the headline, quote, A broken home didn't break me or my kids. In it, famed memoirist Joyce Maynard recounts the very typical story of her divorce, reflecting back on all the pain and strife to share some happy news. When it comes to her children, quote, despite the dire predictions that haunted me long ago, all three have made loving and committed relationships that have produced two grandchildren so far, Maynard wrote. That is to say, the fear-mongering of reactionaries adjusting to the sexual revolution decades ago did not come to pass in her experience. Maynard doesn't explicitly purport to be representative, and her Times essay is purely personal, with no data or generalized conclusions. In that sense, the op-ed is merely the latest entry in the genre of elite myopia, where educated cultural arbiters use their platforms to normalize life choices, their immense financial and social resources allow them to absorb with greater ease. Here we stumble into what Tim Carney has dubbed the, quote, Lena Dunham fallacy, in which we see elites downplaying the importance of institutions like marriage while continuing to marry at higher rates than the working class. Tim defines it as, quote, the tendency to attribute to decadent elites social phenomena really located among the working class. In his book, Alienated America, Tim wrote, quote, the norm of marriage is dead not among our elites, but among our working class. It's not the Wesleyan alumni living in Greenwich, Connecticut, who are killing the norm as much as it is the working class men and women living in middle America. He goes on to crunch the data on marriage rates and economics, trying to find out why, as David Autor of MIT found, losing factory jobs reduces the number of marriageable men. Tim persuasively concludes destruction of community is the culprit. So let's return to Maynard. The New York Times is influential, producing articles with enormous reach that show up in Facebook feeds and email chains and ra radio segments stamped with an air of legitimacy, albeit a decaying one. But according to her website, Maynard first came to national attention with the publica publication of her New York Times cover story, An 18-Year-Old Looks Back on Life, in 1972, when she was a freshman at Yale. Since then, the bio continues, she has been a reporter and columnist for the New York Times, a syndicated newspaper columnist whose domestic affairs column appeared in over 50 papers nationwide, a regular contributor to NPR, national magazines including Vogue, the New York Times Magazine, and many more. Impressive resume. She's written 18 books, including a Times bestseller. She left Yale in the early 70s to carry on an affair with J.D. Salinger. When she re-enrolled in 2019, Maynard's decision was chronicled in a New Yorker profile. In other words, her essay is a textbook example of the Lena Dunham fallacy's consequences, as elites use their powerful platforms to normalize lifestyles that hit the working class much harder, people who generally lack the money and community to absorb the blows quite as breezily. Getting divorced as a journalist and an award-winning journalist is different from getting divorced as a retail worker in rural Wisconsin or the inner city of Milwaukee, or as the children of those workers. More importantly, the data shows that Maynard's experience is an outlier. David Leonhardt sought to summarize the research in a 2015 analysis for The Upshot. Here's part of that article, which cites Autor again. Boys who grew up with two parents seem to end up substantially stronger economically, according to a survey of the research by David Autor, an MIT economist. Girls appear less likely to become pregnant as teenagers, according to another study. Among the reasons, households with two parents tend to have more money and some less tangible benefits, including less stress, more involvement from grandparents, and less unexpected change. New research published just last month by the Institute for Family Studies led its authors to report, quote, what we can conclude is consistent with a long-standing social scientific consensus about family structure. Children are significantly more likely to avoid poverty and prison and to graduate from college if they are raised in an intact two-parent family. This association remains true for both black and white children, they added. In the vast majority of cases, these homes are headed by their own married mother and father. I reached out to Brad Wilcox, one of the authors of that study, to get his thoughts on Maynard's piece. Quote, when it comes to addressing some of the biggest challenges in America, from crime to school failure, our ruling class is silent regarding the elephant in the room, the family factor, he told me. Guess what factor is more important than money and race when it comes to avoiding prison and graduating from college? the family factor. Yet the impact of family structure is studiously avoided in the media, public schools, and C-suites across America. No one wants to talk about the ultimate privilege, being raised by your own two parents. That's what Wilcox said. He's right. It's the ultimate privilege, and the Ivy Leaguers at the Times don't want to touch it. We know two-parent households help children avoid poverty in prison, but the Times and the rest of the, of the corporate media is content to keep running flowery essays from celebrated white memoirists that normalize arrangements hurting working-class kids. 
I'm happy things seem to have worked out for Maynard and her kids, but the Times continues to cluelessly amplify the voices of elites at the expense of the working class, and not just because it publishes the economics of Brett Stevens and Paul Krugman. Again, Carney makes sense of all this. In working class, people are getting married less and are earning less. Behind both of these phenomena is a weaker community, he wrote in Alienated America. It's not a question of genes, that some men are just naturally better at marriage and earning than others, but instead a question of environment. Some places have less social capital and fewer strong families, which in turn makes it harder for the people in those places to make good money or build families. The decline of social capital can't be blamed squarely on liberal elites. Workers have agency, and a lot of us across the class divide are making bad decisions. But all those Republican donors who bankrolled GOP lawmakers to construct an economy of cronyism while also steamrolling small towns with outsourcing and gig work deserve a hefty share of the blame, too. What's worse is that they do it while paying lip service to the conservative ethics of God, family, and country. Here's more from Tim. A hyper-individualized capitalism is currently taking us toward a world where workers are available when needed, but no lasting attachment is formed. Formed. Work can't form an institution of civil society because work is no longer a place or a company or colleagues. It's a series of gigs. Shifting norms and laws when it comes to divorce have saved a lot of women and a lot of children from hostile and abusive homes. There's no question about it. But single parent households, whether through divorce or births out of wedlock, are hurting the working class much more than the wealthy people who write essays for the New York Times and can afford to deal with the pain. Ryan, I think Brad Wilcox is right that this is kind of a third rail. Nobody really wants to touch this, particularly on the left. And that's really interesting to me because the plight of the working class is something the left purports to care very deeply about. And it seems to me that you can't talk about that without also talking about family structure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's fair. And, and for what it's worth, I was raised by a struggling single mom. And our, our father was involved in our life. He was two and a half hours away, we'd see him on every other weekend, a lot in the summers. Right. And I remember, you know, very much being jealous of, of kids who were growing up in these, in these two parent, uh, house, in these two parent households. They had, you know, they, they just had a lot of advantages, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of the, you know, the care and emotional support and also in terms of just the, uh, just the logistical exactly. support. It's incredibly difficult. You know, there, there were times she was working uh, two jobs, one, two full-time jobs. You know, one and one would be this this like the overnight at a halfway house, mm. um, and the other at a at a at a nursing home. And then in between that, you're trying to raise raise two two boys. And I think Carney is is exactly right to look at it uh, from uh, from a more global perspective, uh, global in terms of terms of holistic. You know, the 1970s and 80s. It, it, I don't think. People are too quick to say that it was the, the cultural norms that changed that created the, the rise in, in divorce. Like the sexual revolution. Right. They're right. too quick to point to that without looking at, oh, actually, what about the, the way that neoliberalism, neoliberalism was smashing American families and atomizing them? 100%. Maybe that pressure is what then led to the the liberalizing of of the norms because it was it was happening yeah and so because if you go if you go back to the last period the late 1800s uh where where you're seeing families just getting utterly crushed by 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 capitalism you you see the same thing you see fa you see uh, family formation uh collapsing and then as the economy is improving through the through the 40s and 50s you see the, the family formation coming coming back together so I think people misunderstand the, the direction of, of this, like which, what, which is causing which. Right, and it's easy to see. I mean, I remember the first day we did the show last month, um, I talked about a paper mill in rural northern Wisconsin that had closed and really had been the back ba backbone of the small town. And you can see how when you take the backbone of a small town's economy, these are fragile ecosystems. It doesn't just affect people's paychecks, it then goes and affects their entire lives. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, I think your point absolutely about the logistical, even the logistical benefits and advantages of two parents, 
you have often two salaries. When you don't have that, you then have to pay incredible amounts of money for childcare. These are things that are like very obvious, but difficult conversations to have. And that's what really, I mean, it's what makes me angry about the Republican donors who talk about God, family, and country, but don't give a damn about what they're doing to family. Um, and then on the other hand, it makes me crazy to see op-eds like that one in the New York Times, which is totally fine to publish in like the Washingtonian or in some sort of like elite magazine. But for a paper that purports to be covering the entire country and to doing it in a fair and a relatively balanced way, to come in and just publish this perspective on sort of like how this divorce was very painful but breezy without mentioning any of the privilege or any of the class aspects of it, I just find so insulting. But it's also more than being insulting, it's just an incredible, I think, glimpse into how wildly out of touch the New York Times is, even at a moment in its history when it's trying to be in touch. Right. Yeah, and, and two of the biggest things that put pressure on, on a relationship, uh, particularly if people have kids, are money. That's what most fights are, are about between, between couples, uh, whether they're married or not. Uh, who are in a long-term relationship, but then also time. And so the two means that, and Carney talks about this, the, the two means that people have of employment in this commentary, you know, shift, shift work and gig work. And both of them put pressure on relationships because if you're doing shift work, often you're finding out what your shift is for the next week on say, you know, Thursday night. You're, you're finding out that it's actually Saturday afternoon, now you're in. You're in. Mm. You, you weren't short, you, you're in. Now you have to tell your partner, hey, Saturday afternoon, I, I, I have to work until midnight. Uh, or if it's, if it's gig work, you have, you, you know, you're, you're, they, they say, oh, it's, you can just work whenever you want. But no, you're, you're, you, you're working when, when the, the little box is telling you that, oh, prices are highest right now. So if you go to work right now, you're going to make more than if you go to work at, at some other point. And so you can say that that's, you get to choose when you want to work, but you don't really get to choose when you, when you want to work if you, if you want to get paid the most you can for your time. And so th that, that puts an extraordinary amount of pressure on a relationship because eventually you're like, God, Saturday again? We don't have any, we don't have any child care. I had, I had plans. Uh, the kids have this. And now, now you have to work, and and, the, and then the, the the partner's like, yeah, it's not my fault, it's the boss's fault. But you you can only deflect that onto the boss for so long, and eventually the relationship internalizes all of that anger. And Tim's point about gig work is fascinating, and this is based on some interviews about how it also creates the situation where you're detached and you're sort of able, if you're like a young 22 year old man, and this is as you're entering in the workforce, it totally creates this climate of detachment from community and from stability, and you just sort of it's it's hyper individualism mm -hmm. is how Tim says it, and that's a very interesting critique coming from the right, and I think a very accurate one. And you can see how that gets projected then into people's communities more broadly if you're just sort of sitting around until you work and you're doing a lot of work, but you're doing it without any detachment to a boss. As you just said, it's a totally new world, a totally new world. And I think we're just scratching the surface of it. We've only barely started to feel the consequences, and they're already pretty severe. Yeah. And if we can give workers more power, you know, push up, push up wages, and, it, and it make permanent the child tax credit that, that gives people some financial breathing room, you could actually then see family formation improving. I'm really curious to see, um, in particular, if the, the durability of the child tax credit, the effect that it has in some of these situations. But I'm looking forward to what's on your radar next, Ryan.